Selling your car to Carvana is as easy as... As easy as pie? Sure. All you have to do is enter your license plate or VIN. As easy as a stroll in the park. Okay. Then just answer a few questions and you'll get a real offer in seconds. As easy as singing. Why not? Schedule a pickup or drop off and Carvana will pay you that amount right on the spot. As easy as playing guitar. Actually, I find that kind of difficult. But selling your car to Carvana is as easy as... Can be. Visit Carvana.com or download the app to get an instant offer today. Wells Fargo presents one of the surest ways to grow your money. A Wells Fargo CD account where you can earn a 5.00% annual percentage yield on an 11-month term with a minimum opening deposit of $5,000. Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash CD rates to open a CD account and start growing your savings with us. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. This is Space Time Series 26, Episode 4, for broadcast on the 9th of January, 2023. Coming up on Space Time, uncovering the quantum mysteries of black holes, NASA's angels playing a harp, and five new Australian satellites launched by SpaceX. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study suggests that the universe's most exotic objects, black holes, can have different masses simultaneously. The mind-bending findings, reported in the journal Physical Review Letters, are based on new calculations looking at the quantum properties of black holes. Black holes are an incredibly unique and fascinating feature of our universe. Put simply, they're singularities of infinite mass in zero volume. Black holes retain only three properties, their mass, their spin, and their electric charge. And incredible as it sounds, the laws of gravity as we understand them only predict these three properties. The study's lead author, Joshua Fu from the University of Queensland, says the new research suggests that these ultimate gravity worlds' ability to have different masses means they're even more bizarre than previously thought. Fu likes to think of black holes as being created when gravity squeezes a vast amount of matter incredibly densely into a tiny space, creating so much gravitational pull that nothing, not even light, can escape. It's a phenomenon often triggered by the collapse of dying extremely massive stars. However, Fu says until now, scientists haven't deeply investigated whether black holes display some of the weird and wonderful properties and behaviours that are seen in quantum physics. Now, one such behaviour that gets a lot of attention is superpositioning. That's where particles on a quantum scale can exist in multiple states at the same time. Think of a hat in a box. Now, in the quantum world, that hat is both white and black at the same time. It only becomes either white or black when you open the box and look at it. And as weird as it sounds, that sort of experiment, using subatomic particles, has been proven to be factual. But for black holes, Phil and colleagues wanted to see whether they could have widely different masses at the same time. Turns out they do. Fu says, imagine you're both broad and tall, as well as short and skinny, all at the same time. Now, it's a situation which is intuitively confusing since you're anchored in the world of traditional physics. But he says this is reality for quantum black holes. Now, to reveal this reality, Phil and colleagues developed a mathematical framework allowing them to place a particle outside a theoretical mass superposed black hole. Mass was looked at specifically because it's a defining feature of a black hole, and it's plausible that a quantum black hole would naturally have mass superposition. Research co-supervisor Magdalena Zich says that this research is in fact reinforcing conjectures first raised by some of the pioneers of quantum physics. This work shows that the very early hypotheses of Jacob Bekenstein, an American-Israeli theoretical physicist who made fundamental contributions to the foundation of black hole thermodynamics, were correct. Bekenstein postulated that black holes can only have masses that were of certain values. That is, they need to fall within certain specific bands or ratios. It's the same way as how energy levels work in an 
atom. Electrons around the nucleus can only be in certain specific energy levels. The new modelling shows that these superposed masses were in fact in certain determined bands or ratios, just as predicted by Bekenstein. Now it's important to note that the authors didn't assume any such pattern going in, so the fact that they found a pattern came as somewhat of a surprise. Fu says the findings showed that the universe is revealing itself to be even more strange, more mysterious and more fascinating than most people could ever have imagined. There's usually a distinction made between astrophysical black holes, which are the the ones that we look with our telescope into the sky uh, and observe their, their signatures by various means. And then there's theoretical black holes, which are basically the kinds of solutions to Einstein's theory of gravity that the mass equations solve and we can construct these theoretical black holes that behave as we would expect them to behave in outer space, but we can more easily manipulate their properties and study some weird phenomena and do crazy things with them. And it can be on a really small scale. Yeah, exactly. So as you may know, black hole is a region of space where matter, mass is compacted into a tiny, dense region such that the gravity is so strong that nothing can escape the pull of that region of space. So they're black holes because even light can't escape the gravitational pull of these objects. It's a lot like me getting to a wetsuit when I go surfing. I know the feeling. (laughs) Now, when I went to university, I was told that black holes only really have three properties, mass, spin, and electric charge. Now, your research is suggesting that one of those properties is quite variable. That's something that I thought only neutrinos could do. Tell me about it all. Yeah, well, if we believe quantum mechanics is true, then quantum mechanics should apply to the whole universe. And that includes objects in uh, that are very very large. We should expect that even gravity can behave quantumly. And that includes objects described by gravity, such as black holes. And so a unusual and counterintuitive property of quantum mechanics that we know uh, is that objects can possess multiple properties simultaneously and this principle is known as the superposition principle. So what we sought to do was to study the effects and the phenomena produced by black holes when they have a mass that is in a superposition of different values simultaneously. And the reason why we're interested in this is because a lot of interesting physics usually comes about when we study effects at the intersection of quantum mechanics and gravity. So we basically applied the principle of superposition, a very quantum mechanical effect, to the astronomical scale of a black hole. And that's the kind of intersection of these two theories that usually gives rise to new insights into physics that is unexpected and unexplored. And there were properties you found that had been predicted in the relativistic world, which also turned up in the quantum world as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So in the 80s, a pioneer of quantum gravity, so-called, the field of quantum gravity, Jacob Bekenstein, basically came up with this idea that if black holes are actually quantum objects, then they should behave in a similar manner to how quantum objects behave at the microscopic scale, the atomic scale. So he treated a black hole as if it were an atom. And an atom, as we know from quantum physics, has certain properties, has certain allowed values of its energy, for example, has certain allowed values of its momentum and its spin. And so Bekenstein reasoned that if black holes are truly quantum, then they should behave like atoms. And so an atom, being a quantum object, can also exist in a superposition of, for example, energies or different momenta. So it can have different masses, different energies simultaneously. And so we reasoned, okay, if that's the case, then we should extend Bekenstein's conjecture to black holes such that they should be able to be in a superposition of masses or energy. And what we did was we created this black hole, this theoretical black hole in a superposition of masses, and we stuck a particle outside the black hole. And the, the particle can sort of interact with the black hole and the environment that the black hole produces, the extreme gravitational vi- environment that the black hole produces. And we found that the particle reacts to this environment in a very particular way that actually gives us a signature of Bekenstein's original idea that black holes should have these special values of the mass, these discrete values that it can allowably have. And so we basically, without assuming anything about Bekenstein's conjecture, we were able to independently corroborate or independently verify his original ideas about what black holes should behave like 
in a theory where black holes are actually quantum objects. And so that's the main result of our paper. When you extrapolate that out, does that mean when we look at a black hole and we predict its mass by its effect on something orbiting around it, does that mean we can't trust that anymore? Um, I would say that the, you know, the uh, allowed values of the mass of a, of a, of a black hole, they uh, the, the spacing between the different masses would be minute. They would be on the level of the Planck scale, the so-called Planck scale, which is just basically a very tiny number. So when, when we're dealing with um, quantum objects, we, we have the uh, length scale known as the, the, Planck, the Planck scale. And this basically is a measure of how the discrete masses of the black hole can exist within. So the difference between certain allowed values of the mass, I don't think they would be necessarily observable. But in principle, the fact that they take on a discrete value is a still a drastic departure from what we would typically understand how mass should function. You know, we, we respect mass to be a continuous parameter. You can have a black hole that's anywhere between 10 kilograms and 20 kilograms. But what this is saying is, what Bekenstein was saying is that, no, the black hole can actually only have a mass that's 10 kilograms or 12 kilograms or 15 kilograms and so on. So its effect on perhaps telescopic or astronomical observations probably wouldn't, um, yeah, wouldn't account for much. Yeah. What inspired you guys to do this research? Well, the sort of frontier of theoretical physics at the moment is this sort of decades-long pursuit to unify gravity, which is Einstein's theory of how mass curves space and how objects with mass attract each other and how they move through space. And quantum mechanics, which is the theory of how things move and behave at the subatomic level. And so this is sort of this holy grail of theoretical physics. But this problem has proven to be very hard. And so physicists have sought to approach this problem from sort of the bottom up, from taking what we know about gravity and what we know about quantum theory and sort of putting them on top of each other, so to speak. So to study systems, study different kinds of environments where these two theories and the effects that they produce overlap a lot. And that's how we hope to gain further insight into how eventually one might completely unify quantum mechanics with gravity to come up with a theory of quantum gravity. And so there's been a, a significant history in how pioneers of this field have derived new effects and new phenomena by studying black holes, which are on the one hand, these extreme gravitational environments with quantum mechanics, for example, um, considering how particles behave around black holes and so on. So this is what motivated us. Yeah. So do you like your universe loopy or stringy? <laughs> well, um, the... Uh, <laughs> i got to tell I you, I'm a loop that, quantum gravity sort of guy. Uh, well, I guess if we want to sort of take an approach to science that we seek empirical evidence for our theories and we want to eventually confirm our theories through experiment, then in reality, string theory has taken on some hard times recently for its basically inability to be verified in, say, for example, experiments. As for loop quantum gravity, there are people who, who work in this area who have conjectured similar ideas to our paper that sort of fall out of the theory of, of loop quantum gravity. And so if I had to pick one or the other, I would probably lean towards loop quantum gravity uh, because <laughs> yeah, because predictions like black holes with superpositions of masses can sort of fall out uh, eventually from, from the loop quantum gravity perspective. Yeah. When you look at the whole idea of gravity, is it a force or is it simply an effect? Is there an actual particle of force called a graviton? Yeah, well, uh, that's another line of research that is being hotly pursued at the moment, uh, which is this search for the elusive graviton. And so there are four fundamental forces in nature, uh, and gravity is by far the, the weakest of these forces. And and so it's been very hard to detect the presence of this graviton. So I should, I should mention that these four fundamental forces, which we know are gravity, electromagnetism, and the weak and strong nuclear forces, they're all mediated. So they, they, they're carried by fundamental particles. And so we've observed the fundamental particles that are associated with the th three other forces, electromagnetism and the weak and strong nuclear forces, but we haven't been able to detect this elusive graviton. But actually, in a research field adjacent to mine, there have been some very exciting experimental proposals that 
also consider particles in superposition that would give evidence if the experiment were performed and done, then this experiment would give evidence that such a graviton exists and that wow. the graviton is the force, the force carrying particle of gravity. <laughs> that was a very oh, roundabout way. See, I want to see that experiment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, as you'd expect, you, you, it's very hard to get, you need objects, particles that are, bit, are massive enough to produce their own gravitational field, but are small enough so that you can put them in superposition. So there's this very fine balance between creating these kinds of experiments where you need particles that actually can emit gravitons and interact with each other. That's Joshua Fu from the University of Queensland. And this is Space Time. Still to come, they say angels don't play with harp. Well, that's proven to be wrong because NASA's angels have just played with harp. And five new Australian satellites launched by SpaceX as part of the Transporter 6 mission. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Hello, Saver! Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. NASA has used a powerful harp array in the remote north of Alaska to study an asteroid. The asteroid 2010 XC15 is estimated to be about 152 metres wide, and it was making a pass of the Earth at a distance of about 769,000 kilometres. The experiment used the powerful harp transmitter array to send long wavelength radio signals into the asteroid to learn about its internal structure as part of efforts to defend Earth from future major asteroid collisions. HARP stands for High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program. It was initiated as an ionospheric research project by the United States Air Force and Navy and DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. HARP was designed and built by British Aerospace to analyse the ionosphere and investigate the potential for developing ionospheric enhancement technology both for radio communications and for surveillance. Think of Australia's own Jindali over the horizon radar system. However, HARP has also become a major target for conspiracy theorists who insist that it's a clandestine operation designed to weaponise weather. They allege the system's radio frequencies manipulate the surrounding environment, changing weather patterns over large areas. They say this also unnaturally impacts the Earth's upper atmosphere and it jams all global communication systems. The conspiracy theorists also claim it disrupts human mental processes, interferes with wildlife migration patterns and can even negatively affect your health. Scientists say those pushing these conspiracy theories are uninformed, as the claims made fall well outside the abilities of the facility, if not the scope of natural science. The results of the asteroid experiment are now being analysed by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. It's the first time an asteroid observation was attempted at such low frequencies, and it shows the value of HARP as a potential future research tool for the study of near-Earth objects. There are several projects out there which can quickly detect asteroids, determine their orbit and shape, and even image their surfaces, either with optical telescopes or planetary radar setups, such as NASA's Deep Space Communications Network, which includes large, very sensitive radio antennas in California, Spain, and Australia. The HARP experiment follows tests last January and October when scientists bounce long wavelength signals off the moon in preparation for this week's experiment. However, these radar imaging programs can provide information about an asteroid's internal structure, such as whether it's a solid chunk of rock or a loosely bound pile of stones and dust. That's important because understanding the makeup of an asteroid's interior, especially if a large asteroid, one big enough to cause major damage on Earth, can increase the chances of an effective defence. 
and knowing the distribution of mass inside a dangerous asteroid will also help scientists targeting devices designed to deflect an asteroid away from Earth. The Dick Space Network uses signals of short wavelengths, which bounce off the surface and provide high-quality external images, but don't penetrate an object. It's the long-wavelength radio signals such as those used by HARP which can reveal the interior. HARP's three powerful generators transmitted chirping signals of long wavelengths for some 12 hours. The University of New Mexico Long Wavelength Array near Socorro and the Owens Valley Radio Observatory Long Wavelength Array near Bishop, California were also involved in the experiment. This test is also being seen as a dry run for a future experiment involving the asteroid Apophis. Apophis will make its closest approach to Earth on April 13, 2029. During that close encounter, Apophis will pass just 32,000 kilometers above the Earth that's closer than many satellites. The 400-metre-wide space rock discovered back in 2004 was initially thought to pose a serious threat to Earth, depending on how Earth's gravity interacted with it, with some scenarios showing a likely impact with Earth either in 2032 or 2068. The good news is more precise details on its orbit and trajectory have now ruled out both dates. But Apophis remains a potentially hazardous object, one we need to keep an eye on. This is Space Time. Still to come, SpaceX starts off the new year by launching five Australian satellites. And later in the science report, just as finally for nuclear physicist Robert Oppenheimer. All that and more still to come on Space Time. SpaceX has started off the new year setting a new launch record as the Falcon 9 rocket sends 114 satellites into orbit aboard the Transporter 6 mission, including five Australian spacecraft. The dedicated small sat rideshare flight from Cape Canaveral Space Launch Complex 40 involved no less than 82 individual deployments into sun-synchronous orbits between 525 and 550 kilometres in altitude. It was the 15th flight for the same Falcon 9 core stage, which again returned to Earth successfully, touching down on Cape Canaveral's landing zone 1 just 8 minutes after launch. Stage 1 locks load complete. With that call out, liquid oxygen loading is complete. On the first stage, we'll hear a similar call out on the second stage. Stage 2 locks load is complete. So with that, we are fully loaded with about a million pounds of propellant on the vehicle. Some uh, clouds coming out from the vehicle. These clouds are coming from the transporter erector lines. Uh, The transporter erector provides the propellants to the vehicle. We're just clearing out the lines and the cold... Current gas close-ups. The cold oxygen that is in those lines ends up coming into contact with the moist Florida air and produces literal clouds around the vehicle. Coming up, next major milestone will be Falcon 9's transition into startup. That means that the flight computers on board the first and second stage will have taken over the launch countdown and they'll continue to have control of the vehicle through the rest of the mission. Next major milestone will be the launch director giving their final go for launch. Go for launch. And with that call, all systems go for launch as this Falcon 9 takes the Transporter 6 mission to orbit. 10, 9, 8, 7, Six, five, four, three, two, one, and lift off. Good goals pitching down range. Take one chamber pressure is not. Falcon 9 clearing the tower at Space Launch Complex 40 and making its way to orbit. We are currently throttling down uh, the drilling 1D engines on the first stage in preparation for the point of max Q. It's a point of maximum aerodynamic pressure. Falcon 9 is supersonic. Maximum aerodynamic pressure is the point when the highest stresses are experienced by the vehicle during the ascent. That's cute. And with that, we are through the highest stresses on the vehicle. Coming up, we've got several events back to back. The first of those is main engine cutoff, or MECO. There will shut down the nine Merlin 1D engines in preparation for stage separation. Stage separation is where the pneumatic pushers will separate the first and second stages. 
And then we'll have second engine start number one. We just heard a call out for MVAC chill-in, so we've begun chilling in the turbo pumps in preparation to start the Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage. While the second stage engine is burning, the first stage will be performing a flip maneuver, and then it will do a boost back burn. That boost back burn will ignite three of the Merlin 1D engines to make the first stage's way back towards land, since we are attempting a land landing today with this first stage. So again, those events back to back, Miko, stage separation, first stage flip, second engine start number one, and then the boost back burn. Stage one shut down. Stage separation confirmed. Impact ignition. Stage one boost back startup. So there is those five events, the first stage boosting away and the second stage continuing to burn. Now this burn on the first stage will last about uh, 47 seconds and the second stage is going to continue burning for a while. It won't complete its burn until the T plus eight minutes and uh, 20 or so second mark. Shortly after the boost back burn ends, the next major milestone will be fairing separation. Stage one boost back shut down. So there is successful shutdown of the boost back burn. Some pulses there from the attitude control system. We use nitrogen gas as our attitude control medium, and it helps us keep pointed in the correct direction. The bursts firing on the first stage as we are also deploying our fairing grid fence. separation confirmed. We will be attempting to recover both of these fairing halves once they land back in the water on a recovery vessel named Bob. We're in the first of two Merlin vacuum burns. First burn will last until about the T plus eight minute and 20 second mark. Next major milestone will be the first stage's entry burn. Now we execute the entry burn in order to slow down the first stage before hitting the densest parts of the Earth's atmosphere. Vehicles are on a nominal trajectory. Without that burn, we'd be only using the atmosphere to slow down the Falcon 9, and that puts a lot of extra stresses on the rocket. So we ignite three of those Merlin 1D engines to slow down as we hit the thickest parts of the Earth's atmosphere. We had an on-time liftoff, 9.56 a.m. Eastern Time from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, and we're carrying the Transporter 6 mission on the second stage right now. It's SpaceX's sixth dedicated small sat rideshare program and our first mission of 2023. We're targeting at least three dedicated rideshare flights to sun synchronous orbit per year. We also offer opportunities to ride to orbit on our Starlink missions, which launch about once a week. Now these small sats can ride to space on our Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy, the Starship vehicle in the not too distant future. The grid fins have deployed on the first stage. We've got four of these hypersonic grid fins near the top of the stage. And uh, once we get into the thicker parts of the atmosphere, it's only the grid fins that do the steering to make our way back to landing zone one. Next major event, that's the first stage's entry burn, but will ignite three of the Merlin 1D engines. Stage two, FTS has saved. That Stage one, entry burn startup. Drop off dramatically as the entry burn is slowing us down. Pretty quick burn. This one will last about 20 or so seconds. On trajectory. Stage one, entry burn shutdown. And there is successful shutdown of those Merlin engines. Now, as we are slowing down, re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, if you're uh, in the Florida area, you may hear some sonic booms. Stage one, FTS has saved. We are attempting to recover this booster for the 15th time today, targeting this land landing at landing zone one. We've got just one more burn, which is the landing burn on the first stage. We'll ignite just a single center Merlin engine. That'll happen just before touchdown. Stage one, transonic. Stage one, the center engine stage has one ignited. Landing burn. We'll expect to see the four stage landing legs deploy guidance. for a soft touchdown at landing zone one. Now during this, we'll also hear a call out of second engine cutoff on the second stage. Stage one landing leg deploy. Seco. Stage one landing confirmed. So landing is complete. We also heard a call out there for Seco. Nominal parking orbit. Seco is second engine cutoff number one. We just heard a call out as well for nominal parking orbit. And with that, we have landed the Falcon 9. It's our 161st landing of an orbital class rocket. This booster is 15th. Now coming up, our next major event will be in about 45 minutes. That is for second engine start number two. And that'll be followed shortly by the first 35 payload deployment events. Included in the payload were five 60 kilogram air traffic management system prototype satellites built by Canberra company Skycraft as part of a three month proof of concept test program for Air Services Australia.
If successful, Skycraft plan on developing a global constellation of more than 200 satellites over the next two years, providing air traffic control management services for pilots. The systems designed to provide aircraft with traffic management coverage as they cross remote areas, places like oceans and deserts, where surveillance gaps exist in global communication systems. The Skycraft satellites are using local Australian technology and equipment, ranging from printed circuit boards produced in Newcastle, satellite frames built in Wodonga, and thermal finishes applied in Queen Bean. The largest single customer aboard the Transporter 6 mission was Planet. It had 36 Super Dove Earth Imaging CubeSats in the payload. This increases Planet's satellite constellation to over 500. Also included in the manifest were 12 Space B Internet of Things satellites for SpaceX owned Swarm Technologies. Spire Global set up six Lima CubeSats for its growing satellite constellation, monitoring maritime and aviation traffic using ADS B technology. Also aboard Transporter 6 were four Satellogic Earth Imaging satellites, four Kleos Radio Frequency Intelligence Gathering satellites for Luxembourg based Spaceflight Incorporated. These will be used to search out hidden and illegal activities from space. There were three synthetic aperture radar imaging satellites deployed for ICI, two satellite phone communications CubeSats for LINK, two synthetic aperture radar imaging satellites for Umbra, then there was the Gamma Alpha Solar Cell Technology Test Satellite for French company Gamma, the Bro 8 Radio Frequency Intelligence Gathering Satellite for French startup Unseen Labs, Electro-optical infrared weather systems included a new technology demonstration CubeSat for the US Space Force's Space Systems Command. Then there's NSLCOM's quaintly named Beetlesat. It's a 9kg spacecraft designed to provide high-throughput telecommunications services, transmitting at rates of up to 2 gigabits per second using innovative new software-defined radio technology and a deployable antenna communications payload. The last satellite to be deployed was the EOSSAT-1, EOSTA's first agriculturally focused analytic satellite. It's the first of seven spacecraft being built by Dragonfly to monitor the health and growth of crops. The Transporter 6 mission also included several orbital transfer vehicles, or space tugs. These were all fitted with their own payloads which were designed to be deployed later. They included two deorbit ion space tugs, each carrying a series of small satellite payloads, including NPC Space Mines Futura 1 and Futura 2, their 3 and 6 unit CubeSats designed to demonstrate the company's new CubeSat platforms, as well as Artica, an innovative deorbiting sail designed to accelerate the orbital decay of spacecraft, thereby reducing the amount of space junk currently circling the Earth. Also aboard were four 5 kg CubeSats for Astrocast as well as the Sharjah Sat-1 X-ray Space Telescope, which will detect hard X-rays from very bright astronomical X-ray sources, with a secondary payload using a dual-camera system for Earth imaging. The Tel Aviv University's Tau Sat-2 research satellite was also included. It's carrying a scientific payload of light-emitting diodes that will be used to conduct optical tracking experiments looking for miniature objects in space. It also included an S-band transmitter, that same they're demonstrating a novel new communications protocol in various signal-to-noise regimes. There's the 4kg Kelpie 1 3 unit CubeSat built by AAC Clyde Space. It's designed to deliver automatic identification system data. The Drago 2 CubeSat is a project by the Institute of Astrophysics in the Canary Islands to develop a compact multispectral shortwave infrared Earth observation satellite capable of high-resolution images. The Milan Polytechnic set up the Genergo 2 experimental space propulsion system so that it can be tested in orbit. Then there was Cryptosat 2, an enhanced version of a prototype nanosatellite developed by Cryptosat for secure cryptographic applications. It can be used for things like electronic voting, trusted random beacons, and verifiable delay enforcement for smart contacts. Other space tugs sent aboard the Transporter 6 flight include Launcher's first orbital transfer vehicle and the second momentous Vigoride orbital service vehicle, which this time hosted Caltech Space Base Solar Power Project payload and also deployed a satellite carrying the Osmosis Zeus-1 payload. Just a few days earlier, SpaceX launched a new Earth Resources satellite for Israel from the Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. 
the Earth Resources Observation Systems NG3 or Eros C3 Earth Imaging Satellite was launched aboard a Falcon 9 rocket into an unusual retrograde orbit, meaning it circles the planet against the direction of Earth's rotation. Designed by Israel Aircraft Industries and based on an OPSAT 3000 class satellite platform, the spacecraft has a panchromatic imagery resolution of 30 cm and multi spectral imagery down to 60 cm. The 400 kg satellite is owned and operated by Imidsat International, which was founded by Israeli Aircraft Industries, LOP, and Core Software Technologies in 1997, and now also includes both the Italian Space Agency and Telespazio. The first two Eros satellites, Eros A and B, were launched aboard Russian Star 1 rockets from Siberia back in the years 2000 and 2006. But the Eros C3 is part of a new generation constellation, which also includes the old Eros C1 and C2, which were repurposed from the OFEG 11 and 16 Israeli spy satellites. These were launched aboard Israeli Shevet 2 Comet 3 stage rockets from the Palma Chim Air Base near Tel Aviv in 2016 and 2020. Three more satellites are expected to join the Eros NG constellation, including the Eros C4 as well as the Erosar 1 and 2, both of which will operate in the X band spectrum. Following the launch and after MECO or main engine cutoff and stage separation, the Falcon 9 core stage performed an RTLS or return to launch site landing, successfully touching down on landing zone 4, just a few hundred metres from Space Launch Complex 4 East, where it had taken off just seven and a half minutes earlier. This is Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. There's a new superbug warning out today, with a report by the World Health Organization showing that high levels of resistance in bacteria are causing an increase in many life-threatening bloodstream infections. The study warns that doctors are now also seeing an increasing level of resistance to treatments for several bacteria causing common infections in the community. The new antibiotic-resistant superbug report is based on data from 87 countries, including Australia. The report shows that more than half of all common hospital bacteria, which frequently cause bloodstream infections, such as Klebsiella pneumonia and Acne bacter, are now showing higher levels of resistance. These life-threatening infections are now requiring treatment with last-resort antibiotics. However, 8% of these bloodstream infections are now reported to have become resistant to even these last resort antibiotics. The report warns that even some common bacterial infections are becoming increasingly resistant to treatments. In fact, over 20% of E. coli isolates, the most common pathogen in urinary tract infections, were resistant to both first-line drugs and second-line treatments. In a feat that would make both Harry Potter and the Klingons jealous, scientists have discovered a species of frog that seems to turn invisible. Known as glass frogs, these amphibians somehow manage to hide their blood when they sleep. A report in the journal Science claims glass frogs can turn two to three times more transparent when they sleep by moving almost all their red blood cells into their liver. The liver then conceals the blood with a coating of reflective crystals making the frog appear to be almost invisible to predators. Scientists still haven't worked out how the frog survives this transformation, as it has almost no circulating oxygen and concentrates so much of its blood in its liver that it should end up with fatal blood clotting. In a sign that the wheels of justice can turn slowly in the United States, U.S. Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm has overturned the 1954 decision revoking the security clearance of nuclear physicist Robert Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer was one of the most influential and important scientists of the 20th century. He led the top-secret Manhattan Project to beat the Nazis in developing a workable nuclear bomb. Use of this weapon against Japan finally brought an end to World War II, saving hundreds of thousands of Allied lives. However, Oppenheimer was opposed to America's decision to deploy the bomb against the city rather than simply demonstrate its destructive power first. That would ultimately lead to the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission's decision to end Oppenheimer's government career. 
Grunholm says the historical evidence suggests that the decision to review Professor Oppenheimer's clearance had less to do with any real concerns over national security and more to do with the desire on the part of the political leadership of the Atomic Energy Commission to discredit Dr Oppenheimer in public debates over nuclear weapons policy. A new study suggests that déjà vu, that weird feeling of reliving an event or experience, may be triggered by a spatial resemblance between a current location and an unrecorded scene from your memory. The work by psychologists at Colorado State University is based on the Gestalt familiarity hypothesis. The study's authors point out, however, that it's likely there are many other factors which can also contribute to what makes a scene or a situation feel or seem familiar and more research is underway to investigate additional possible factors triggering this mysterious phenomenon. Importantly, the researchers dismiss any suggestions that déjà vu can be caused by some sort of paranormal, supernatural, or psychic abilities. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics says the studies clearly show that the only past lives associated with déjà vu is your own. Déjà vu is something we've all experienced at some stage. It's supposed to be the, you've heard that before. Someone says something to you and you say, I've heard that before. Or you go to a place and you say, I've been here before. And that's the yeah, déjà vu French for already seen. And when it happens again and again, it's déjà vu all over again, as they say. One suggestion from a psychology lab was perhaps you have seen it before, but it's somewhere else in a place that looks like where you are. They're making the example of a hospital. Right? You go to a hospital to visit someone, you say, I've been here before, this is weird. And they suggest, well, all hospitals look alike, so you very well might have been to a hospital that looks like it, but you're not aware of the link with you know, where you are now and where you were before. So there's a psychological memory issue there. They're pulling up this memory of a place you've been to and making it appear that you've been there before. In other words, they're saying, yes, you have been probably, but it's just a different place and a different memory. Sort of like a Bunnings or a Kmart store. Or a Hilton Hotel. They're all designed to actually make you feel comfortable wherever you are in the world. McDonald's is the same. They've got the same menu, so you feel comfortable with it. Someone suggested deja vu is actually your memory and your synapses playing a trick. This was one theory. I don't know how valid it is. One theory that a memory goes through the wrong way in your brain, and it comes out in, in the place where you're actually, you've got your current visual or audio inputs. Therefore, what you're seeing with well, a memory, you think is actually you're seeing it right now. Yeah, well, and memories so, are very manipulative. Our memories are constantly changing. They edit themselves all the time. They're very unreliable, our yeah. memories, yes. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from Spacetime with Stuart Gary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash space time with Stuart Gary. And Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 